I invest in things that wouldn't happen without that company, ideally. I don't particularly want to invest in the third or the 23rd video sharing startup or you know, doing Groupon in another country doesn't excite me. Doing something new and interesting that's useful does. And how have you seen the market change since you started investing? So when, when I first began long, long ago, there, there was a startup market, but it was very expensive to start up because most startups either built hardware or they used a whole lot of hardware and it was very expensive. So the good news was you didn't have a lot of competition as a startup, but you had to go out and have a good idea or connections and raise money to do almost anything. You couldn't buy a $5,000 server. You had to buy a million dollars worth of computer equipment to do almost anything. So what you have now is, is a completely different environment where everybody wants to be a CEO, wants to be an entrepreneur, and a lot of people really shouldn't be. They, they might be completely great heads of development. They might be wonderful salespeople. Being a CEO is way overrated, and not everybody can do it. I was not the CEO of my company after the first couple of years. I had a, a CEO who did all the work, and I got to do all the fun stuff. I, I wrote the newsletter, I traveled around the world, I ran the conferences, I got to talk to interesting people. And Daphne, my CEO, stayed in the office and managed the people and dealt with the real estate and paid the bills and all that. So those of you who think being a CEO is glamorous, it really isn't. And if your investors tell you that they want you to become chairman or chief strategist, they may well be right, and you may actually be much happier if you do that. Have you seen consistent traits in the CEOs that you've worked with over the years, the good CEOs? Well, the good ones are, of course, smart and honest. And uh, the ones I like the best also have senses of humor and senses of humility. There are companies I won't invest in, even though I think they'll make money, because I don't like the people. And that's one nice thing about being an angel. It's your own money. You can spend it the way you want, and you don't need to apologize to anybody if you, either if you make a bad investment or if you miss one. So. And what about bad CEOs? What do you see in bad CEOs? Um, they don't listen. They don't understand their own limitations. They, uh, I mean, the very worst lie to themselves, not just to you. I mean, sometimes they tell you what they think is the truth because they don't, they're self-deluding. And there's more of those than you'd think. So I was, one of my startups is a, they watch you play games and they attempt to kind of analyze people's characters and put people into suitable jobs. And so we got into this thread about psychopaths. You know, could, could we recognize psychopaths? And someone else found a study that said the, on average, 1% of people are psychopaths, but 4% of CEOs are. <laughs> and I mean, some of these guys do actually become successful if, because if you get beyond a certain level, people around you will support you in all kinds of craziness or, or bad behavior. But if you have a good board, a psychopath doesn't make it. And yeah, so the worst ones are self-deluding. They, you know, if someone tells them no, they don't understand it. And I've run into a few of those. Fortunately, not invested with many of them, but I have run into them. And in your current investments, what are you, what's exciting you in terms of healthcare? Um, all of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the board of 23andMe. I'm in Health Rally. I'm in Health Tap, Health Engage, Health Village, which is <laughs> now called Medico, uh, Health Loop, uh, Kias, Organized Wisdom, and Ahmad is actually one I really like because it deals with this issue of motivation and it, in itself, it attempts to train people. And I think 
you know, my goal in healthcare is not to replace all the people. It's to make the people more effective. And number one, and number two, to stop people from getting sick in the first place. And in those investments that you've made, what, what excited about, what excited you about those companies the first time you saw them? Um, well, it was different things in each case, but mostly I thought they would make a difference and have an impact. And most of them are more focused on prevention than on care. And that's a theme for you, focusing on prevention? Yeah, now. I mean, it's, it's more cost effective, it's earlier, it's, uh, it's, it's better to treat your car right than to have to take it to the shop all the time. Fair enough. And how's your investment thesis or philosophy changed since you started investing? Yeah, well, I don't have much of a thesis. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's always been kind of at the edge of what people were doing. It hasn't changed that much. The, the specifics have changed. The, the markets, what people will buy has changed, what people can make has changed. I, I mean, the shift from internet to health because how many of you studied math? Okay, so you've probably had a professor who is working on a proof and he types a whole, writes a whole lot of equations on the board and says, there, that is the proof. The remainder is left as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> and to me, that's the point where we are at the internet. The, the readers can take over, but health, we're still at the beginning. So if someone's coming to you with a, um an idea or an opportunity, what should they bring to that first meeting? Ah, well, usually, unless I don't have time, I want to know where they came from, what, why they're interested, what got them started. I mean, I'm not claiming every VC you meet or angel you meet will want to know this, but I kind of like to know, well, what, what drives this person? Um, who's the customer? Why are they going to buy it? Uh, what problem are you solving that other things don't solve? Yeah. And then what's your business model? Most people that you give your business model to, they, they won't believe your numbers. I mean, that you, you, you will never produce the numbers that you put on your chart. They'll either be low or high. Or, but what we want to see is your understanding of the numbers the sensitivity of those numbers to different things happening. What's, you know, not how big is the thing, but what is the structure of it? What, what will make it grow? What will not work? What depends on what? So kind of what's the mechanism that's going to turn this into a real business? And then because whatever your business is now, it probably won't be in five years. How will it change? What Will you be good at changing it? Will you understand how to turn it into something else when the market changes? And how do you, what's your filter for all the opportunities that come your way? Well, it's sort of random. Um, if you don't spell right, you know, it varies. If you, if you say, you know, if it's an editorial kind of thing and you don't spell right, that's really pretty bad. If it's engineering and you don't spell right, it may be forgivable. So, it's the thing to understand is you, you go out and raise money. Some people have a real process, but a lot of life is really random. And what that means is be persistent. It, it may not be that they don't like you. You just happen to send your plan in on a day when they had 14 other plans and they didn't get to yours. Yeah, you, should, you should not be obnoxious, but you should be persistent. So I often get emails that say, did you see the email I sent you two weeks ago? <laughs> and, you know, I probably did. But don't make me go look for it. Just send it again. And whenever you send a communication to anybody, make it easy. If you, tell, if you want them to call you, give them your phone number. If you want them to come speak at your event, give them your address. Uh, <laughs> if you want them to invest, say so up front. I mean, the, the best emails are fairly short, 
they say up front what it is that they want. They make it easy for you to say yes, and they sort of lead you to the next step. The, the difficult ones, I get a lot from outside the U.S., and so y you might think these are hilarious, but I get a lot of them, you know, like, Dear Miss Dyson, is it okay to send you a plan? Uh, you know, just go ahead and send it. I can always not read it. Don't. Uh, then there are others that send simply a file with no description of what's in the file. Uh, my all-time favorite one was a guy from England who wrote and said, Dear Esther, my aunt heard you on the telly and she said I should write to you. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's always good to have a recommendation from somebody, but ideally, it's somebody I know. <laughs> and even better, it should come from that third person, because if they really recommend you, they should be willing to do it, rather than have you say that they come recommended. And so what that means is you need to write to your friend Bob and you need to make it really easy for Bob to recommend you. So you don't write to Bob, Dear Bob, please recommend me to Esther. You write, Dear Bob, I would very much like to talk to Esther about a possible investment. I know she'll be interested in my company because blah, blah. And then maybe one more paragraph. And then all Bob has to do is hit reply and add my name to the CC. And he's done. And that, I'm, I'm just amazed at how people don't do that. Because whenever you want someone to do you a favor or respond or just make it so easy for them that they can handle your email the first time that they see it. So the emails I respond to fastest are the ones where I say, thank you so much, but this really isn't in my area of expertise and I can't give it the attention it deserves. Yeah, those are easy to write, and so they get answers right away. Then they're the ones where I kind of think, yeah, I'd like to know a little more. I'll come back to it. And then two weeks later, I get another letter saying, did you see the plan I mailed you two weeks ago? <laughs> so be persistent, but the easier you make it for people to reply, the, the more they will. So you talked about trusted referrers. Yeah. Who are your trusted referrers? It, it will vary. It varies a lot depending on what it is. In healthcare and, specifically? Um, even there, I mean, it, it honestly, it, it, it does in fact depend on what, what they are referring. It's not, you know, oh, I see this comes from, I don't know, John Doerr, I'll, I'll answer immediately. I mean, if it comes from John Doerr, I will pay attention. But I won't necessarily, I mean, I always tell people, I can, I can get so-and-so to return my email, but I can't get them to say yes. And what it gets to make people say yes is the content, rather. Th but if you're dubious, certainly coming from someone I know that I think has good judgment is going to help a lot. What are your common sources for new investments? trusted referrers. <laughs> I mean, it really, it's, it's amazing how much of a difference it makes, partly because if, if they can't, if a company can't find a trusted referrer, it's not a good sign. And it means, either it means nobody wants to recommend them or they're too lazy. Uh, whenever I get emails saying, well, I get a lot of emails saying someone I don't know said I should write to you. Sorry, they say John Briggs, and I don't know who John Briggs is. Uh, I'm sure other people use my name that same way, and you know I wasn't really involved, or maybe I used somebody's name once or something. the The best referral really does come from the individual themselves. They've bothered to send an email. They they like you enough that they're not embarrassed to send out an email with your name. And 
you know, and you have to earn that. I mean, it, it is a pretty good filter. Life, life is arbitrary. So when you're making an investment, what's your expectation of a return? Uh, so it, your expectation is always you'll make millions and millions of dollars. You're, but I try not to make, I try always to make investments where I expect to make millions and millions of dollars, but where I wouldn't really mind even if I didn't. And there have been bunches of those, you know, where I really liked the people, the investment didn't work out, uh, they were honest, I liked the idea. I mean, there are some cases where somebody lost me money and I'll still invest with them another time. Partly, as someone once said, I spent so much money getting them educated, <laughs> <laughs> now I should benefit. Um, but I like to do things where even if the, the company failed, I learned something, they learned something, we did something worthwhile. Uh, you know, ideally, even if the company failed, maybe somebody picked up the technology or the three founders learned a ton and now I can back them doing something else. It's, I mean, anybody in the angel business is used to a lot of their deals failing. It's not shameful. I mean, there are shameful failures, but the mere fact of a failure isn't shameful. And so you, you try and pick ones where you will not feel your time was wasted, even if your money was. Would you mind sharing some, some of the success stories you've had? What are some of the more successful investments that you've made? Let's see. Um, and it's success by your definition. I'm not just yeah. talking about okay. return. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, so, I mean, there haven't been that many in health yet. It's still early days for most of my health stuff. I was in MedStory, which ended up being acquired by WebMD and, and sorry, Medscape. And MedStory was acquired by Microsoft and became part of Bing. And, you know, I wouldn't say that one was a huge financial success, but the technology lives on. I love the founder, whose name is Alain Rappaport. They've contributed a lot to Bing and to some of Microsoft's work in health. And so that was one where, you know, I couldn't even tell you what the return was. It was, you know, I don't think it was, I don't think I got my money back, but I got some money back. And, but I'm perfectly happy with, with that one. Uh, roaring success. I spent probably 10 minutes talking to John Doerr about one of his funds. And that was the fund that had Google at 12 cents a share. <laughs> so I did very nicely on that. I funded a lot of other things I've done. Um, yeah. M so Yandex went public. Uh, Datomi. I mean, all these companies, none of them went off and became Zynga, but a lot of them became interesting companies or parts of interesting companies. I know I'm sounding very vague. I'm trying to think of one or two that are... Google's that not are, bad. Yeah, but that... The ones where you struggle more are Flickr. Flickr I still use almost every day. I was an early investor in that. It's now part of Yahoo. It's probably one of the best parts of Yahoo. And I love it. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. And so do you have, do you see best practices in the startups that you're working with that you could share with all yeah. of us? Yeah. Um, best practices are obvious. Bad practices are you forget to send out invoices. Uh, you don't hire, you're, you're too techy, you don't hire a business person. You don't test your product. I mean, you need to test your product on real people, but you need to tell those real people that the product isn't ready. There's, there's a difference between a beta product, which doesn't have all its features, and a buggy product that doesn't work or does things wrong. And, and that's sort of an important distinction. There's an awful lot of hygiene that makes business work. You, you need to 
you need to run the business right. You need to pay the people you hire. You need to be honest. Uh, but then, you know, a business, the specifics of any business are very, very specific. And you need to do those right. And that's the challenge. Um, before we spoke, we asked all the Rock Health members um, if they had questions for you. And one particular question was, I spoke with you a number of years ago when you were doing a lot of work in Russia. A geopolitical question. What does the short term future of Russia look like? Do you think there will be much positive change in terms of politics and economic development? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Okay. So, I'm optimistic because it's my nature more than because I have a huge amount of evidence. The people I know, things are, there's a lot of really good stuff going on in Russia. There's a lot of really bad stuff going on in Russia, including demographics. The, I think the men, an average boy's life expectancy is something like 56 right now. Uh, yet at the same time, I'm extremely excited about what's happening there politically. People who a year ago told me, I don't want to get involved in politics. It's, it's, it's not just that most of the politicians are, are crooks and corrupt, but the idealists in politics are foolish people who have no chance of changing anything anyway. And now half my friends were in the protests and it's, it's very exciting, but completely unpredictable. So, but I do spend a lot of time there and anybody who does want to talk about it, I'll gladly do that offline. So another question was, do you have a sense for how large or active the healthcare angel investor market is? Is it more East Coast or West Coast focused? Um, they're different. Out here, it's, it's much more IT and, and self-monitoring and, and stuff like that. In the East, there's more devices and sort of more traditional biotech as opposed to health IT. And there, I was at a Life Sciences Angel Network meeting last night. So there's, there's a lot going on in New York. But it's more medical. And out here, it's more health and wellness. I mean, those are, it's, it's not that there's not genetics and 23 million things out here, but if you had to make that distinction, that that's the one it would I'd make. Yeah, here it's a bunch of techies. Over there, it's a bunch of doctors. So if I'm a startup and I've passed, someone's given me a referral, and you and I are sitting down together, what are the most common reasons that you'll pass on investing in my company? Um, I'm just not excited. Feels yeah. like you're saying that to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, but I mean it's 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 like. It's like getting married. You know, it may not work out, but at least at the beginning, you should be excited. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, because you you look at you look at the person across the table, and you know they're going to have problems. You know, something's going to go wrong. The the first version of the product won't work, or the head of sales will leave, or a competitor will start doing something way too similar or something like that. And so do I want to be helping this team deal with those problems or am I going to be saying, oh, I knew I shouldn't have invested in these guys. And you need, you need, that, you need that willingness and that eagerness to help when things go wrong because it's easy when things go right, but they never do all the time. Which technologies do you see having the biggest impact in consumer medicine and digital health? Well, the, the, the big one, obviously, is the internet and social networking. Um, certainly, uh, yeah. what's the word? Non-invasive sensor devices. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to basically mention um, Sano, Sano Intelligence, uh, <laughs> changing the business model for, for sensors. I mean, sensors are huge, and, but so, so many things are. Uh, I mean, this is what's exciting about healthcare. There, there really are 
so many different things that need to be done, can be done, can be changed, can be replaced. <laughs>